Good morning and welcome to our 233rd weekly webcast. Now, if this is the first time you're joining us, welcome. If you've been with us before, welcome back. And so the way this call works is this is an AMA, like on Reddit, ask me anything. You can ask me business questions, personal questions, career questions, investing questions, any questions you want to. And my goal here is to humbly help you take your career or your business to the next level. So without further ado, let's begin. I can't believe that I'm soon going to be on the sixth year of, of doing this. It's been fun. I'm never going to stop. Okay, so first up, I've got Jatan who wrote, uh, what are your views on the latest FOMC meeting, meaning Federal Open Market Committee meeting? Yeah, so the Federal Reserve, uh, just for the first time in, in close to a year, they, they, they stopped raising rates, um, but they did kind of signal that they might raise rates again if inflation takes off a bit. And so a lot of people expect that by this July, they might raise another 25 basis points, meaning 0.25%. And the reason they're not raising rates uh, anymore, at least in, in the last F FOMC meeting, uh, is because uh, inflation has come down to about 4%. It was about 9% one year ago, so things are definitely getting a lot better. Um, now, China actually uh, has started to cut rates, which is a big shock to the world. And one of the reasons is because China is, is it was an export-oriented nation for now. Uh, they're very much dependent on the U.S. Uh, for exports. Uh, and the U.S. economy has slowed. Uh, and so they, they've started cutting rates. And other regions of the world are in a recession, uh, including uh, New Zealand. So um, I still think, and an economist still think, that the likelihood of a recession in the United States is 50-50, uh, by the end of this year. And as we all know, a recession uh, means two consecutive year-over-year -year quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. Yeah. All right. Next question I've got is from DF who wrote, um, how does one find the TAM, meaning total adjustable market for private equities? Isn't TAM based on the industry participants in which acquisitions are made? Yeah. Um, so TAM stands for total addressable market, and we always want to invest in companies or start companies that are in massive markets. Uh, and in the venture capital sector where I used to work, I partnered with a firm called Kleiner Perkins. And Kleiner Perkins quite often does not invest in companies, meaning startups, that, doesn't, that don't have a TAM of at least $20 billion. And the reason is because in the unlikely event that a company uh, in a TAM that has $20 billion gets 5% share, then that would mean a billion dollars in annual revenues. You always want to cast your net as wide as possible when starting companies or investing in companies. In terms of finding the TAM in general, the best thing to do uh, for private companies is do a search for total addressable market, then the sector name, and then McKinsey. Okay, that's a big consulting firm. And if that doesn't work, do a search for total addressable market, then the sector name, and Accenture, or Forrester, or Gartner, or other, uh, other uh, consulting firms. Now, if you can't find the total addressable market for a sector, then what you can do is you can add up the revenue for the top 20 or so companies in a given sector globally. And you can do this by going to their websites or going to sec.gov and looking at the annual reports. And the reason I say this is it's a very conservative way to calculate the TAM, uh, but the top 20 companies in any particular sector usually dominate and comprise well over 80% share. Yeah. Now, when it comes to private companies, it's tough to really find the TAM of, of, of industries that don't yet exist, but they actually do. And I know it sounds convoluted, but if you were doing uh, research on Uber uh, or Lyft when they were both private, and the online taxi market didn't really exist, or you didn't think it did. It actually does. It did. What you would do is you would look at the old school taxi medallion market, okay, as a total addressable market, uh, and then calculate it that way. The same thing with Google. I remember when Google went, went public back in 2004, it was hard to find the total addressable market uh, for the, the global uh, uh, search market and advertising market online. So what you did in that case, I remember years ago, I participated in the IPO. What we did was we looked at the total addressable market globally of traditional newspaper classified uh, outdoor uh, billboards from companies like Lamar, uh, CBS, etc. Right. So, and if you have additional questions on that, uh, please let me know. And thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next question I've got here is, hey, Prashant, good to, good to see you. What's a reliable source for industry or sector-wise data uh, for the U.S. Uh, uh, economy? Yeah. 
So uh, there's a great website called Kaggle. That's K-A-G-G-L-E. And I'm very soon going to be releasing uh, a, a complete artificial intelligence course, which is going to be part of the MBA degree program. If anybody signed up for the MBA degree program uh, on my website, you'll get that for free. And the best way to get sample data sets is to go to Kaggle. Okay, so Kaggle is this great website that will give you sample data sets and real data sets as well that you can use. Uh, other sources for industry, um, uh, uh, industry overview reports are, as I mentioned earlier, consulting reports from companies like McKinsey, Accenture, uh, uh, Forrester, Gartner, if it's a tech sector, uh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, you can also go to uh, just do a search on the Bureau of Labor and Statistics or the BEA uh, for the United States as well uh, to find out uh, data uh, on relative sectors. Now, what I usually do from a top-down perspective uh, when I'm doing macro-related research is I go to the World Bank's website or the IMF's website, and you can download massive amounts of data as well. Yeah. And if you are going to use ChatGPT to do this sort of thing, please be careful because you have to double check the data sources because quite often I've learned that ChatGPT is confidently wrong. Yeah. Always look at the sources. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Movid wrote, uh, hi, Chris. Hey. I heard that lots of hedge fund managers are computer scientists. Is this true and why is this true? Yeah, I, I don't think so. Um, portfolio managers um, usually are not, they don't have a computer science background. Quite often they have a finance background. But large hedge funds do employ lots of computer scientists uh, to work on analytics as well as looking at linear regression to find patterns in data um, so that they can try to outperform the market or come up with pair trades, meaning longs or shorts. Yeah. And machine learning and AI are very important tools to understand and deep learning as well. Um, if you want to have a very successful career in finance or any sector in the long run, which is why I've been working very, very hard on, on putting out this new uh, uh, complete artificial intelligence course. Now, as, as part of the course, which again is going to be in my MBA degree program for free for all my MBA students, you can go to HarunMBA.com to learn more. Uh, we're giving away this book, which is only available in the course. I'm teaching this course uh, with uh, Luca Ennison, who I had on this webcast a couple of weeks ago. And Luca, uh, according to Google, is one of the top 150 machine learning experts in the world. Machine learning is a, a component uh, of, uh, of artificial intelligence. He's a really tall guy, and you'll never forget his name because it's <laughs> Luca Ennison. You know, Anakin Skywalker. But this is a prop from the course, yeah. I am a nerd, you all know that. How the hell do I turn this thing off? There we go. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up, I have got here. Uh, Movid has another question, which is, which is, what do you think about the future of risk management powered by AI? Yeah. Um, so, I think that the the company that's going to be at the forefront of this is Bloomberg. So, Bloomberg uh, recently announced uh, what's called Bloomberg uh, GPT. Now, Bloomberg has over forty years of of financial data. And what they're doing with Bloomberg GPT is they're using it as a tool for subscribers to Bloomberg um, so that portfolio managers uh, can slice and dice data and do better portfolio construction and risk management uh, as, as well. Um, so there's no other player in the marketplace right now uh, as strong as Bloomberg from an AI perspective in the financial services sector. Yeah. Okay. Uh, 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 next up, um, I have got... Prashant, Ipshant, good to see you, who wrote, uh, why particularly in business do most of the successful people are not very qualified when it's about education and why less education is a mantra of success uh, in business? Yeah, uh, education will open doors, um, but quite often, quite often people that get into great universities get in because of who their parents are, not in all cases or through donations, et cetera. So the whole system is, is ripe for disruption, which is why I'm doing what I'm doing right now. Now, it's interesting because if you look at university enrollments and applications in 2019 versus this year, they're down 8%, right? And that's ignoring COVID as well, the pandemic in the middle there. So I think that universities are in secular decline. Um, a lot of the best companies in the world do not require a university degree to work there, uh, including IBM, Google, Facebook, Wells Fargo, and many, many others as well. I really do believe that um, within 50 years or so, there probably won't be more than 50 or 60 universities uh, in existence. 
Um, and I think what's going to happen is a lot of people are going to say, well, I'm not going to go and get a university degree uh, unless it's from a great school like an Oxford or Cambridge or Harvard. So I think those schools will be harder to get into, but I think other schools will be easier to get into, including the schools that, that I went to. Um, and I, I think what's going to happen is a lot of these universities, uh, initially they're going to dip into their endowments, right, to, to, to pay for the shortfall of enrollments. Uh, and then eventually what will happen is there will be like a Hail Mary pass. They'll call all their alumni to try to uh, send donations to, to keep the school afloat. And then they'll run out of that. Uh, they'll be depleted and they'll go belly up. I really believe that the future of education is online, which is why I do what I do. Yeah. And if you want more details on that, you can watch my TEDx talk I gave uh, years ago uh, on how T can fix all problems in the world. TEA, Technology, Education, and Acceptance. And the key there is online education, which is accessible and affordable for all. Okay. But the most important thing in business in general is, is networking. You know, relationships are always more important than product knowledge. You know, and at the very beginning of my, my MBA degree program, we talk a lot about networking how to, and how to network on steroids. If you're not interested in my MBA program, you can download my networking book uh, for free. Just go to my website, which is harunmba.com. And if you scroll all the way down, you can download this book called Networking to Get Customers a Job or Anything You Want. Yeah. Now, th the issue is that a lot of people that, you know, they're, they're, they're in high school or even undergrad, if they get good grades, you know, they, they, they might get a job and they're proud of themselves and life works when you get good grades. Then they join the workforce and they keep their head down kind of like they did when they were in school and they try to do a really good job and they think they'll get noticed. They'll think they'll get a raise and a pr or promotion for, for keeping their head down and doing a good job. And then they look around. This happened to me and many of my students earlier in my career. They look around, they realize, oh my God. Why are all these other people getting raises and getting promotions faster than I am? I mean, they're not more qualified than I am. I think I'm doing a better job. And one of the reasons is because they networked internally in their company and they found mentors. You have to do that. And they asked. You have to ask for a raise or promotion. You'll never get it unless you ask. And all these vice presidents that work in these companies that you all work at, um, the reason they got to VP was not just for doing a good job. They got there because they had lots of mentors and because behind closed doors, they've asked for a promotion or a raise multiple times. The bottom line is relationships are more important than product knowledge and your network is your net worth. And if you don't have a university degree, you can still get a job at a great company. You just have to, just have to network like crazy. Okay, And I teach about that in that book I just showed you as well as in my MBA degree program in a lot of detail. And a lot of people actually, um, high school dropouts, a lot of them, or, or even university dropouts, um, have dominated their industries. You know, a lot of people start in the corner, or pardon me, in, in the mailroom, and work their way up to become CEO. And I've got plenty of examples of this. One of them is Sidney Weinberg, who is the former CEO of Goldman Sachs for a couple decades. Uh, you've got Simon Cowell, who also started in the mailroom, um, David Geffen, uh, Barry Diller, pl plenty of people. Yeah. And the reason why a lot of people from, from the mailroom, you know, tend to become successful is because, you know, they're, they're very social and they network. You know, every morning they walk through the companies they work at and they say, top of the morning, did you see the baseball game last night? The Blue Jays beat the Yankees like they always do. Here, here's your mail, that sort of thing. So you have to network a lot uh, and be social as, as, as well. And one way to be social and to network um, in terms of how to bond before talking business with anybody in the meeting is to first go to their Twitter profile to see who they follow. You know, if they follow athletes uh, or movies or something you're passionate about, you know what to talk about. And a big rookie mistake in business is you show up for a meeting and you talk about business right away. Never do that. You know, business is about relationships first and product knowledge second. All right. Um, next up, Prashant wrote, how do you find out if financial reports are fabricated due to window dressing? Yeah, yeah. So you only want to invest in companies uh, that have well-known auditors, like the big four auditing firms, KPMG, Cooper, Deloitte, et cetera. Um, and when you look at companies to invest in, you always want to read the annual report and the quarterly reports and make sure that those financials have been blessed uh, by a well-known auditor. If it's not a well-known auditor, 
don't invest, especially if it's a publicly traded company. Yeah. Okay, but there's there's certain things you can look for in financial statements to find out if they're cooking the books or uh, if they're misleading investors. And what I recommend, and I teach a lot about this in my MBA degree program, um, but what you can do is you can read a book by Howard Schillett, who is the, uh, the head of the, the CIFRA, uh, which was a forensic accounting uh, firm, and he wrote a book called uh, Financial Shenanigans. Okay, And you look at patterns in the data to find out uh, if financial statements are somewhat misleading. Again, that book is called Financial Shenanigans by Howard Schillett. I was his client uh, when I worked in the hedge fund industry. He helped me out with a lot of short ideas too. Okay. All right, next up, uh, Caroline. Caroline, how are you? Caroline is from France. Uh, she lives in Ontario, Canada. She's in my Silver uh, MBA degree program. Uh, uh, Caroline wrote, good morning, Chris. I'm looking forward to seeing you at Silver Hour. Likewise, likewise. And if anybody's in my Silver MBA program, uh, every week at 10 a.m. on my time, meaning in less than two hours, we have a one-hour Zoom call uh, just for, for Silver students. Looking forward to seeing you. Moving on to Durs, who wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, what do you think about trading, meaning arbitrage, uh, swinging, and day trading? Yeah, uh, I, I say this with love my heart. Please, let me get down on my knees. Please don't trade. Please don't trade. There's a reason why we don't know the names of successful day traders, because they don't exist. Because what happens is every single month has 20 trading days. There's 20 weekdays when the markets are open. And stocks go up or down for reasons completely outside of our control. And so you end up getting fooled by randomness. It's impossible to make money by trading. You know, and, and the worst thing that can happen is you start day trading and you make money. And I say that because you're fooled by randomness. It's like saying the first time you go to a casino, you know, you play blackjack and you win a lot of money. It's not repeatable. The odds are stacked against you. So when do you do technical analysis then? Well, whenever you look at investing in a company, you want to look at FVT in that order. Fundamentals, valuation, and a distant third is technical analysis. And you might look at technical analysis to understand if a stock is oversold, meaning that's a good time to buy, or if it's overbought, meaning and you want to sell it if it's already reached your target price. Please don't trade. Please, please, please. I promise you will end badly. And I say that as always with love in my heart. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, next up, uh, Man hey, Manas, how are you? Uh, Manas wrote, good morning, uh, my dear mentor, Chris, please. Uh, how are you today? I'm always good, thank you. I hope you're, hope you're doing well. Uh, I worked out a little bit too hard last night. So I'm a little bit, little bit, actually a little bit tired this morning, uh, but I'm okay. Uh, you wrote, uh, I realized something that global warming is damn real. Yes, and it works as well. It, it's terrifying. Yeah, and you, you wrote here, not only that, uh, but we are facing a heat wave and cyclones here in India. Jeez, it's it's crazy, man. It's 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 terrifying, and of course we're seeing this in Canada as well with the fires, which are a little bit more so under control now. Um, but people that live on the east coast of the United States, it, it looks like Mars in the sky because these fires are in, in Boreal in Quebec. Yeah, it's it's terrifying. Yeah, and, and there's a reason why uh, I think buying ca gas-powered cars will be against the law in the United States within the next couple of decades. Yeah, it's frightening. Uh, you wrote here, a great question begin with the Fed signal two more hikes and no cuts this year. Is it good or, or modest? Um, I mean, usually when interest rates, when interest rates are low or are going to be low, um, the markets do very, very well. And the markets tend to discount what's happening six months uh, in the future. And so if we compare and contrast uh, today to the early 1980s, around 1980. Uh, when inflation was really, really high and unemployment was 10%, uh, interest rates then were close to 20%. And whenever interest rates are high or expected to be high, then what happens is nobody wants to buy stocks because you leave your money in the bank or you buy bonds and you can get you know a much higher return, basically risk-free. Uh, and so the market right now, I think we're kind of in a bull market because the market has bounced 20% off the lows. Uh, a lot of investors are, are basically pricing in the fact that interest rate hikes are not going to be as aggressive going forward. And again, low interest rates means stock prices do well and vice versa. When interest rates are high, all asset classes, aside from bonds, are awful investments. Yeah. Okay, give me one second. I'm going to get a little bit of coffee here. Okay. 
I'm using a straw as well. It's my, my, my teeth were getting darker. My, my dentist told me to use a straw when you drink coffee. Yeah. Especially before an interview or when you come on live like this here. All right, give me one second, guys. Uh, next up, Manas wrote, uh, when are you going to be in India? Uh, you have a, a huge following here. Thank you. I, I, I'd, I'd love to come. I, I've been to um, uh, I've been to India before. I went in 2016 when I was a professor during the evenings at, at the Halt International School of Business. I taught a couple classes there. I loved it. Um, yeah. No, thank you. I, I, I'd love to come there. But you know, when I come there, if, if we go out to lunch or dinner together, Manas, when the bill comes, I'm going to say this. I have alligator hands. I can't find my wallet. T-Rex can't do pushes either. Yeah. No, of course I'll buy you lunch. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I will come there within five years for sure. For sure. Yeah. I want to teach some of my MBA classes uh, there as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, Amon wrote, uh, Hey, Chris, I want to firstly thank you for all your help and guidance that you provided in all your courses. Thank you. I appreciate that. God bless you. Thank you. I don't have a job. I have a passion. And thank you all for showing up to this webcast every week and taking my courses. I, I am grateful. And every day when I get out of bed, I always thank God. And this puts me in a great mood for 10 things in this order. Andrew, Matthew, Dylan, my kids. Blue is the theme always. Andrew, Matthew, Dylan, Christine, my wife, my mom, my dad, my brother, Jamie, my sisters, Katie and Elizabeth, and you, all of you, my students. Thank you. Try that before you get out of bed. You'll be in a good mood. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, I'm thinking of writing a book because I know it will take a week to complete. Uh, I'm a little hesitant, but excited uh, for the core. But I want to make a commitment that before July 15th, uh, you'll have uh, the book. Thank you. And I appreciate that. And a, a lot of my students have, have written books, which has certainly helped them take their careers to the next level. Um, I've got a, a number of examples uh, here. Uh, one of the more recent ones is uh, one of my students in the East Coast of Canada, uh, Edward uh, Almonte, wrote The Pillars uh, on Your Way, right? And it's really easy to write a book. I have a template for it. Just go to my website, harunmba.com slash, all lowercase, uh, write book. All lowercase, write, write book. It's a free template, yeah. And it works. And I, I promise you, when, when you go into informational meetings or interviews, if, if you give somebody your book, it's, it's going to help a lot because who does that? And if you think it's too much work writing your own book, ask yourself, how badly do you want that job or that promotion or that customer? It's easy to do. Self-publish if you want to. And that's what I've done. I've self-published for years my own books. I remember in 2015 when I wrote this books and Forbes wrote an article about it. Um, the uh, Obama's editor called me and said, we want to publish your book. And so I, I talked to them for ages about it, decided not to do it though. This is still self-published, it's mine, because they would own all the content, uh, et cetera. So, but, and I'm talking about both sides of my mouth right now because I finally gave in and I'm gonna be publishing a book with McGraw-Hill. So McGraw-Hill approached me last year and gave me a really good offer, they're great, uh, to write a book uh, called um, Finance Essentials. It's part of their Essentials uh, uh, series. I didn't write these ones, but it's part of their Essentials uh, series. The Finance Essentials book uh, is going to come out uh, maybe at the end of this year or early next year. The, the, the senior editor is, is reviewing it now. Yeah. I'm doing that for social proof. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, next up, uh, Aman wrote, uh, I have two questions. Sure. Um, what is the search tool that you use on your website to search topics? And what would be uh, the tool that you would recommend to build YouTube videos without using uh, my voice uh, or, or face? Yeah. So in my complete artificial intelligence course, which is going to be, and you get the book for free as part of the course, it's going to be part of the MBA degree program, uh, which will be released in a couple months. I teach you how to, how to use certain uh, AI websites that will mimic your voice so that it sounds exactly like you. And I'll also teach you how to create avatars and much, much more uh, in the course. Yeah. Um, in terms of the search utility that, that I use, I'll show you here quickly. Um, let me go here. All right. So I have no employees in my company, right? I love using software automation uh, to, to scale businesses. And so I use tons of automation. So right here on my website, this search utility here, and if you type up any, I don't know, 
any uh, any tech or, or 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 business topic, if you click here, you'll see exactly where it is located in all the MBA degree programs. So if you're in silver, you click here to watch the lectures on beta, uh, for example. Now, what I did for this search utility, I pay 120 bucks a month for it. Uh, I outsourced it to a company called uh, 360 uh, Site Search, uh, and it's a company based uh, in Germany. Yeah, and they're great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, Mirna wrote, "Good morning. Uh, this is my first call. Mira, it is great to see you. Welcome to the call. Uh, I hope you join us again. Let us know where you're from as well. And thank you." Moving on to Kevin, uh, who's one of my, my MBA uh, students uh, from Lakeland, Florida, who wrote, good morning. Always good to see you. Uh, and th next up, Manas wrote, inflation is actually 6% now, and the Fed, Fed targets 2%. Really? Okay. I thought I, thought I saw it was, it was 4% uh, th this morning. Let me actually jump, double check that. Give me one second. So every morning when I get ready, what I do is, is this. I'm in the shower, and I say, Alexa, what's the Wall Street Journal news? From the Wall Street Journal. Alexa, stop. So what Alexa will this do? This episode is Alexa, brought to you by Gia. Please stop. Okay, I only said please because it's a live webcast. <laughs> okay, let's go to Wall Street Journal uh, inflation. I think I saw it. it was it was four. I heard it this morning on, on the Wall Street Journal app. Yeah, here it is. Here. Yeah, it's four. It's four uh, percent down from nine percent uh, one year ago. Uh, but I recommend that everybody get an Alexa device, uh, and every morning when you're getting ready, just listen to the news. And you can listen to NPR or any news service globally uh, as well for free. It's great. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Durs wrote: Is there any path to join the American uh, CIA? Financial uh, Criminal Division. Yeah, there, there, there certainly is. Uh, they have their own recruiting department as well. Uh, I think it's probably based in McLean, Virginia. Um, you can contact them and, and ask them or go to their website um, just to find out uh, how, how to join. Yeah, it's hard to network with people in the CIA though because quite often they don't list on their LinkedIn profile uh, that they worked at the CIA. Now the former CTO of the CIA, I hired him uh, to, uh, uh, to be an advisor at, at one of the venture capital firms I, I worked at. And he was actually on, on my board as well. I'll show you. His name is Gus Hunt. And if you want, you can reach out to him. He's, he's a good guy. Gus Hunt. Reach out to Gus and ask him right here. Here he is. So Gus Hunt. Yeah, McLean, Virginia. Um, so, so he used to work uh, at, at the CIA. And what you can do, yeah, right, right here, the CIA. He was a CTO. Uh, you can reach out to him and ask. He's a super nice guy. I'm sure he'll help you. Uh, and maybe I'll have him on this call one week. Yeah. And I was his reference, actually, when, when he joined uh, Accenture, right, where I used to work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, uh, next up, Radu. G good to see you. Radu is one of my, my MBA students. Uh, he is from uh, Romania. Great to see you. Uh, moving on to Manas uh, from India, who wrote, uh, Germany got into a recession last month. So did New Zealand, I saw that. Uh, what are your thoughts and why don't you become the next PM, Prime Minister of Canada? Uh, you'll be better. You'll be a better one, uh, I, I know. Oh, thank you so much. I actually went to, uh, I gotta tell you a story about Justin Trudeau. I went to undergrad uh, with him at McGill University. Um, so I was in my fourth year of undergrad and there was this girl, she was so gorgeous that like nobody talked to her, nobody went up to her, right? Uh, and so I finally got the confidence to go up to talk to her. And it was uh, in the middle of campus. It was uh, some charity event. And, and I went up to her and, and I started talking to her. And I'm talking to her for five minutes and she's still talking to me. I was like, oh my God, what, what's going on? It, this is crazy. I have to ask, I have to ask for her number. Um, and then I kept talking. She's laughing at my jokes, with, which you know are awful. <laughs> uh, and, and then what happened was uh, half an hour later or so, um, this guy walks up. He looks like Jim Morrison. He's got long hair. And then she's like this to me. She turns and she's talking to that guy and laughing at his jokes, which are way worse than mine. And I was like, what the hell is this? You know, the emotional damage, what's, what's happening? And so what I did was I went to the guy, up to the guy and I said, hi, I'm Chris Haroon. Like, like I, I'm anybody, I'm nobody, right? And he looks at me and he goes, Justin Trudeau. Dude, I got Heisman by like a Kennedy. I can't compete with that. 
that's my that's my JT store. Yeah, he was actually pretty nice. Yeah. In terms of politics, there's no way I'd ever do it. Ever, ever, ever. Yeah. Okay. I think I can add more value humbly to the world by, by teaching. Yeah. Because teaching fixes all, all problems uh, in the world. Yeah. Uh, in terms of my thoughts on, on a recession, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's 50 50 uh, by the end of this year uh, that we'll enter into a recession. Yeah. I don't really know. No one knows. Yeah. I don't think it'll be a severe recession. Again, a recession's definition is two consecutive quarters of negative uh, GDP growth. Okay, but it seems like in Canada there's like a one-party system now. No more political talk. I'm going to stop there. Yeah. All right. Alex P., uh, who, who's from uh, Utah, great to see you. Uh, he wrote here, Chris, have you ever worked with the CIA, the FBI, or another uh, similar organization during your VC, Goldman, or, or Accenture career? Yeah. Uh, yeah, with, with, with the CIA uh, in, indirectly, um, what, what I did was I invested in, in Palantir. Um, and, and so uh, CIA, the CIA has a venture capital firm out here in the Bay Area called InQtel, I-N-Q-T-L. And I met one of them with, with the, uh, the founder, the CEO there, the managing director, uh, George Hoyam, in his office. Um, and so people don't realize that the CIA has a venture capital division. They do because a, a lot of the best technologies in the world uh, were in the past government funded. You know, for, for example, uh, the, the, the internet or ARPNET back in the 60s was created um, by the United States government so that the East Coast of the United States could talk to the West Coast in the, in the unlikely event of, of nuclear war. And uh, other tech, technologies were, in, were, were created or invested in by, by the U.S. government. So, for example, Oracle, Larry Ellison's company, um, the first secure massive database that the CIA created was called Project Oracle. And Oracle, or Larry Ellison's company at the time in the 70s, uh, what was, uh, did all that work. Also, uh, guided missiles, uh, that's GPS, right? So a lot of the technology came out uh, of the CIA as, as well. So yes, I have partnered uh, with them indirectly in the past when I invested in Palantir when it was a private company. I'm no longer an investor in Palantir. I sold it before the IPO, yeah. Okay, in terms of working with the, the FBI, uh, no, I've, I've met with a lot of people from the FBI uh, just because I've invested in a lot of companies uh, that, that you know, the FBI uses products for, um, but I've, I've never actually worked um, directly for the FBI. Um, I've been monitored by the FBI, I'm pretty sure of it. Um, when I worked in the hedge fund industry, um, Anybody who works at a large hedge fund, I worked at a bunch of large ones, their calls are probably listened to by the FBI, and they probably were because I, I worked with a guy um, who actually went to jail. He got arrested. Um, I wasn't involved in anything he did wrong, um, but um, I'm sure that my calls were recorded. Yeah. Yeah. So he went, poor guy, he, went, he was in jail for a couple of years. I went down to go visit him uh, down in Southern California in a jail, a prison called Taft, which I don't think is open anymore. Uh, when I went down to, to meet with him, he was in jail I think, for insider information. Uh, but when I was down there to meet with him, um, it's not like it's not maximum security. Like when you commit securities fraud, which is awful. But when you do that, uh, they send you to Club Fed. I shouldn't call it that, but it's like a low end ramada. Yeah. Okay. But definitely my calls were, were recorded by the FBI. Anybody that works at big hedge funds have been recorded. Yeah. All right. I did not work with, with the FBI or the CIA at Goldman or ex, at Accenture. But when I worked at Accenture, I, I worked for a while in Ottawa um, uh, for the Canadian government. Yeah. And I was fingerprinted. They did a background check. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Manas wrote here, uh, the SEC says uh, CZ uh, took public funds into his personal account. Uh, is it illegal uh, and why? Of course it's illegal. Yeah. Oh, of course, and don't ever raise money, anybody, uh, without issuing an investment offering memorandum, right? Like like an SEC document like, like this one here. Hire a lawyer always to do that for you, please. And never invest in any company without reading the financial documents, the investment offering memorandum, even if it's a private company. If they don't have one, don't invest. Yeah. Okay. Now, in terms of, I've known other people that have gone to jail. Um, when I worked in the hedge fund industry, uh, I knew this one guy, really good guy, 
um, from from he worked at, at Galleon um, and actually he didn't go to jail. He, he got off uh, six, six months a house arrest. But I asked him, I, I said, why is it that people do insider trading uh, when they work at, at hedge funds? Um, and his response to me was, was this, and, and I don't justify it, it's awful, of course. He said, well, I, I lived in New York City, you know, on, on the Upper West Side, uh, close to Galleon's headquarters. Um, and, you know, it, my, my kids were in preschool, it was $30,000 a year. And so I had this certain standard of living set up for my family. And if I didn't get a good bonus every year, my standard of living would, would decrease. So that's why it's always important to, of course, number one, never break the law when it comes to securities uh, issues. And number two, always live be below your means. Always. It makes lo life less stressful that way. Okay. Um, okay, next up, uh, Paul wrote, uh, would you buy first property for yourself and then after a longer period to accumulate savings plus uh, remortgage, buy a second and third for rental or rental first and yeah. So what I would do, the first thing you wanna do is buy your own place uh, because you do get a lot of tax incentives uh, and you're gonna save a ton of money by not paying rent. So if you spent 600 bucks a month on rent for your entire life, if you put that in the bank or in the markets, for example, and get a 10 to 15% return, that's over 20 million bucks. Run the math, you'll see. So the first thing you wanna do when you get some money is buy a place. So you're not wasting money on, on, on rent. And it took me a while. It took me until my 30s to buy my first apartment in New York City uh, on the Upper East Side, 87th and 2nd. Um, and that was, that was a great investment for us. Then the second priority you should have after buying your place is maxing out your retirement savings. Okay, so every year you can invest you know, $22,000 or so in the United States tax-free as part of what's called the 401k. If you're overseas, do a search for what is the, put your country's name there, what is the X country equivalent of 401k? Because that's tax-free. You wanna max that out. And you want that money to come out of your bank account, uh, actually out of your paycheck every two weeks, so it's out of sight, out of mind. And as Warren Buffett said, you only wanna spend what is left after saving instead of saving what is left after spending. After you max out your your retirement uh, your your retirement investment every year, then what you should do next, if you have children or plan to have children, is max out the educational savings account for them, which in the United States is about fifteen thousand dollars per year. Then once you've done that, and then they can take that money out tax free uh, when they go to school, if they decide to go to school. If not, they can take it and you know buy a house, whatever. Then what you want to do after that is start looking uh, at um, at real estate. Yeah, and so that's what we've done. We own a bunch of properties uh, in, in Canada, actually, and, and in Texas, uh, and we rent them out. And the places we bought in Canada are close to universities uh, because you know, universities are, for now at least, recession-proof. Yeah. Okay, and get a property manager to manage all that stuff, too if it's not local. And when you get a property manager to manage the, the rentals that, that you purchase or the houses you purchase that are far away from you, you'll pay them like 10% fee per year, which, which is worth it, yeah. Okay. All right, uh, uh, next up, Manas wrote, I've completed five courses from your website. Uh, the still certificate is pending. Uh, what should I do, please? Yeah, it should automatically uh, send you it. You have to watch every single lecture though. So there, maybe there's one lecture you haven't watched. If you have issues, just list the courses and then send uh, an email uh, to support at haroonventures.com and we'll take care of it within a couple of days. And thank you. Okay. Um, uh, next question is, my mentor, uh, Bard, my mentor, Chris, Bard is dumb. Uh, Bard is, is Google's uh, version of ChatGPT. Bard is dumb compared to, to ChatGPT. Why is ChatGPT winning against Google, even though people have billions, even though Google has billions of dollars of free money every time? Yeah, yeah. So the, the issue with Google is the classic innovator's dilemma. So Google actually came up with the, the T in ChatGPT, which I think stands for transformer. They created that technology. But Google did not deploy their own version of ChatGPT, and they could have done it years ago, because people don't understand, or at least I didn't until recently, that when you deploy a massive AI infrastructure, it costs like $100 billion to do, right? It's really, really expensive. 
And so it's a classic innovator's dilemma. If Google had deployed their own version of ChatGPT or BARD years ago, it would have hurt their operating profits by about $30 billion per year. And we all know that monopolies are lazy and they don't innovate. And I haven't seen Google create any innovative product in years, years. And it's only a matter of time uh, until Google is broken up by the US government because they're a monopoly. They own the two biggest search engines in the world, Google and YouTube. Yeah, monopolies don't innovate. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but with BARD, they, they rushed it to market. They were under a lot of pressure by investors and engineers, et cetera, to do it. And when they released the product, or at least gave a, had, had a webcast on it, it was a disaster because it didn't really work. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, uh, Salsa Bill. First time I've seen you on the call. Hope you join us again. Thank you. Uh, wrote here, uh, I'm new to finance. Uh, what is the roadmap uh, in this field? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so it, it's a very, very broad field. There's public finance, there's private finance as well. Um, so uh, the private side, uh, it, it all starts with seed investors or angel investors and venture capital firms. And then what happens is once they invest in companies that grow a lot, then the public side of it takes over, meaning the investment banks will take that company public and trading floors will trade that security, etc. 75% of all jobs in financial services are sales oriented. Yeah, that's why networking is key. Uh, and I have a course you can take if you want called the Complete Financial Analyst Course, where I talk about all major aspects and roles uh, with, within finance. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up, DF wrote, uh, what are the benefits and drawbacks between an unfunded independent sponsor and a funded independent sponsor uh, in private equities? Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by, by independent, but the way that private equity works is when you invest money in a private equity firm, uh, or you commit to investing money, they don't take your money right away. They only take it when they need it. And you get what's called a capital call. So here's how it works. Let's say there's a private equity firm, KKR, for example, and you invest a million dollars in it. Okay, You sign the paperwork for a million bucks. You don't send them the money until they find ideas to invest in as part of that fund. And let's say they find an idea they want to invest in, which is going to be 10% of the fund. Then what they'll do is they'll call you. And it's called a capital call. And they'll say, can you send us $100,000, which is 10% of the fund because we're investing in a company. So that's what makes private equity different from other asset classes. Okay. Um, uh, next up, uh, Manas wrote, um, would you and I in our lifetime see AI dominating humans or at least stronger than us? Um, or is it way too sci-fi now? Yeah. So I, I am worried, and I've done a heck of a lot of research on AI as part of this this, this course that's coming out soon uh, on my website. Um, I'm worried that giving AI too much autonomy early on can really hurt us. And you know, Warren Buffett even, even said that it's like opening Pandora's box. Once you move forward with AI, there's no moving back. And so I think what's gonna be happening is a lot of countries, all countries, are gonna have their own department of AI ethics. And all companies, big companies, are gonna have C-level positions, uh, uh, like CEO, CFO, et cetera, dedicated to AI and ethics. We have to keep it in check. It, it is terrifying, especially with, with deep fakes. So deep fakes is basically a, a process whereby you can pretend to be somebody else. Uh, and a lot of actors are upset uh, that on Twitter and other places, or, or TikTok, I should say, uh, there, there, there's been deep fakes or people that, that have used uh, computer vision, computer technology and AI uh, to replicate them, like Tom Cruise, for example. And those videos are actually pretty funny. Um, but it's, it's, it, there's gotta be some sort of legal precedent for that as well. And don't just use ChatGPT um, uh, for essay writing or anything because, well, number one, we don't know if the data is right. Number two, it's a copyright nightmare. You don't own that copyright, somebody else does. So it's only a matter of time until we see regulation coming uh, to keep AI in check. And I think that's a good thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, next up, uh, Bakul wrote, uh, Chris, I was working in the crypto industry. I got laid off uh, three months ago. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, now regulators are pushing the industry out of the United States. I'm unable to find a new job in crypto. and I'm forced to pivot now. Uh, no idea what to do. I'm very sorry to hear that. Yeah, and it's only a matter of time till the SEC regulates cryptocurrencies like they regulate stocks uh, as well. 
Yeah. Oof. Well, if, if you're on the technology side of cryptos, um, you can easily rebrand yourself and focus on AI, right? And when it comes to uh, AI and blockchain, it's going to be a massive industry when it comes to smart contracts, etc. So what I would do is this. I would take online AI courses. You don't have to take mine. It, mine comes out in a couple months. But just take other online AI courses and try to learn about blockchain when it comes to AI and smart contracts and rebrand yourself that way. But more importantly, what I want you to do, please, is I want you to network like crazy. What I want you to do is have an up-to-date LinkedIn profile, which I teach you how to do in my MBA degree program. Then I want you to reach out to people that have something in common with you. You know, maybe they went to the same high school as you or undergrad as you. Maybe they worked uh, in the same company as you. And I want you to set up just a ton of informational meetings with them. And again, I, I tell you exactly how to do that in my MBA degree program. And I, what I want you to do is I want you to find a list of five or ten companies you want to work for. And then I want you to set up 20 informational meetings with people from each of those five companies. And you do it using LinkedIn. And if you think that's a lot of work, just tell, tell yourself that you know one meeting can really change your life. And, and it's so hard to get a job whenever you see a job opening online. You know, statistically, when you see a job opening online, the likelihood of, of you getting a job by just applying is one out of 250. And the person that ultimately gets that job uh, is somebody that knows a person at the company. So these are the new rules of commerce. So you have to network and meet 20 people at least from that company. You bond with them at first when you meet with them. You always want to bond for business. And then you can ask them, do you know of anybody that might be looking to hire in your company? Ask and you'll receive. It's prophetic. It's been true since the beginning of time. I had a, a student of mine uh, on scholarship a couple of years ago. Uh, he grew up in the projects and he said to me, and he's very successful, he said to me, Chris, one thing I learned is that closed mouths don't get fed. Asking you will receive, it's prophetic, it's been true since the beginning of time. Set up just a ton of informational meetings. Yeah, rebrand yourself uh, out of crypto and into AI. Yeah. All right. And if you're not working in, in a tech role in, in crypto, uh, but you are working in more of a business development role, let me know and I'll talk about how to rebrand yourself using that as well. Yeah. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Bakul wrote, um, uh, I was planning to apply to an MBA to pivot into finance, uh, investment banking, investment management, and venture capital, which you wrote there, but I still need to, to, to get a job now while I prepare uh, but no non-dev roles in crypto and risk risk regulation get cut again as the economy worsens. Yeah, um, yeah. So um, yeah, a again, it sounds like you do work in the tech sector. Um, uh, what I would do is just network, like I mentioned. Yeah, and if you want, let me know the exact role you have uh, in the cryptocurrency industry right now, and I will help you by going to LinkedIn in real time uh, to 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 kind of figure out who to meet with and how to network yeah okay actually dude send me send me an, an email to support at haroonventures.com uh, and I'll, I'll do a 20 minute one-on-one -on -one zoom with you for free of course uh, and, and help you with your LinkedIn profile and help you network as well okay all right all right, next up, uh, Myrna wrote, uh, and I asked you where you're from. You, you wrote, I'm originally from Brazil, uh, but I've been in Maryland uh, for over 28 years. Nice, nice. And your, your Baltimore Orioles are crushing my Blue Jays. We played the past cu couple of days. Yeah. yeah. Brazil is such a massive country, man. And I give a, I remember I give a, a venture capital keynote uh, South, in Sao Paulo. I did a lot of research on the country. Brazil is so big that the north coast of Brazil is closer to Canada than it is to the southern coast of Brazil. And Brazil is so wide, it's a huge country. It's so wide that the east coast of Brazil is closer to Africa than it is to the west coast of Brazil. It's just a massive economy. I've invested a lot of money uh, in the real estate sector there in Cirela, uh, Gafisa, et cetera, over the years, yeah. All right, uh, and then DF wrote, greetings everyone from St. George, Utah, United States. Excellent, excellent. And Alex P, who's on this call as well, is also from, from Utah. Good to see you. I used to go skiing there at Snowbird uh, when I worked in the tech sector. I used to go there every year to the annual Nobel conference. Uh, it was called Brainshare, I think was it the conference, yeah. Okay. All right, next up we got uh, Adrian uh, uh, who wrote, hey Chris, Adrian from France, great to see you. 
I see your last name is Picard. You know, I'm thinking of Star Trek, of course. Yeah, what a great last name. You wrote, I've been following your MBA for the last two years. Great content. Thank you. Quick question. What do you think about Oracle moving um, uh, to the healthcare sector by acquiring Cerner the past year? Yeah. So Cerner's is a company based uh, in Kansas. I've, I've met with the CEO and CFO there one-on-one -on -one a couple of times when I used to go out there to kick the tires. Um, so Cerner, is, it's, it's like an uh, electronic medical records company and a, and a health tech company uh, that hospitals use. So what's happened with Oracle, ticker ORCL, is they, they, they hired a brilliant investment banker from DLJ named Safra Katz years ago, like 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, and she is a financial genius. And she became CFO for a while. And, and what she decided uh, with Larry Ellison's blessing, of course, the CEO founder, is that they need to make acquisitions in order to grow. Because the core database market wasn't growing very quickly. And when Oracle em entered the apps market, it was disastrous, right? They, they couldn't compete. And so what happened was they started acquiring companies. And so back in 2003, uh, they, they acquired a PeopleSoft. It closed in 2004 with a hostile takeover. That's, health, that's uh, uh, human resources-based apps. Then what they did on September 8th of 2005, they bought Siebel, a CRM company, ticker S-E-B-L. Then a year or two later, they bought Hyperion. Uh, then they bought Sun Microsystems, ticker S-U-N-W, which stands for Stanford University uh, uh, Network uh, Workstations. Then they bought uh, NetSuite, uh, which is an incredible cloud-based company based here in San Mateo. And basically, it's a double-edged sword because if you don't buy a big company every year, then it looks like your growth is negative the next year. So they have to make big acquisitions, kind of like Microsoft with GitHub and whoever they might buy next. They bought uh, you know, LinkedIn back in 2016 as well. So it's a double-edged sword. If you, At first, Wall Street loves it when you buy a big company because it looks like, oh, look, revenue is growing. But if you don't make a big acquisition every year after that, it looks like revenue is contracting. So it's a double-edged sword. Yeah. Okay. All right, next up we have Rubina, who's from Pakistan, but, but lives uh, in, in the United Kingdom. Uh, she's in my, my MBA degree program. Uh, great to see you, Rubina. Uh, you wrote, hi, Chris. Lovely to see you again. Likewise, ho hope you're doing well. Um, and, and thank you for, for building schools for, for women as well. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to Rwanda, uh, and I'll, I'm going to be doing this webcast. I'm going to try to from Rwanda uh, in, in July uh, to the school that, that we built. Yeah. You wrote, hope and pray that you and the family are well. Likewise. Can you please uh, tell me where I can access the AI book you mentioned uh, with, with Luca and yourself? Yeah. So this book is going to be exclusively available in the course. Uh, and the course is going to be published um, within a couple of months or so. You will get it for free. Anybody that has already bought or will buy my MBA degree program will get it for free. You'll see it as an elective. And I'll mention it on this weekly call when it comes out. I'm currently editing it right now. There's 16 sections. I've edited four sections on my non-production computer up there. Work in progress. Almost done, though. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, and then Rubina wrote, also, I, I haven't checked. Still recovering oh, from shoulder, sh shoulder surgery. Uh, but have you added uh, more courses uh, to the MBA and, and can access it? Yeah, absolutely. So, so the way to, if you purchased the MBA in the past or you or, or will in the future, uh, the way to access the, the electives, or at least one elective in particular, is to go to my website. I'll show you right here. Okay. So you go to my website, harunmba.com, click right here, okay? And then what you can do is, based on which MBA you purchased, you can click here to access the Excel elective, for example. And in this elective, what I, what I do is uh, I, I teach you every single feature in Excel and programming, everything. And I teach it in an object-oriented way. And what I'm doing is Luca is coming back to my house uh, this fall and we're going to be recording um, a, a course on, on Python to teach you all how to use Python. But I recommend you take the Excel course first because I visualize and I teach you object-oriented programming in Excel first. It's the easiest way to learn programming. And if I meet you in real life, I'm a very tiny man. Yeah. It, when you have kids, you have dad humor, okay? It just happens. Yeah. And I hope you feel better uh, post your shoulder surgery. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Eric, uh, who is uh, from uh, Sarasota, Florida, he's in my, my gold MBA program, wrote, uh, where will the puck be 
in the commercial property market uh, in 10 years. Yeah, it's probably one of the worst investments you can make is, is commercial property. And I love your reference to, to, to the puck. As a proud Canadian, I grew up loving Wayne Gretzky. And one of my favorite Wayne Gretzky quotes is this. They asked him, why are you successful? And he said, well, I was successful humbly, not because I skated to where the puck is, but rather I skated to where the puck is going to be. And so we have to have the foresight uh, to invest in companies that investors are going to like. And I learned that that quote, uh, the methodology of it, at least from an investing perspective, from the CFO of Vestas, big wind company. I met with him back in 2007 in the Bay Area here. Yeah. So commercial real estate is a bad investment. And before I invest in any, any particular company or sector, I always ask myself this one basic question. In five years, will this company or sector be more relevant than it is today? Well, in five years, I think fewer people are going to be driving into big cities to go into offices because more people are going to be working online and telecommuting. And that's one thing the pandemic taught us is that we don't really need to have as many offices in big cities. It's a ridiculous concept if you think about it. You know, if, if Zoom and the internet was created before, before cities, would we still have cities or massive office buildings? Probably not. Think about it. Spending two hours a day driving to go to a big office building, killing the environment with, with your cars, etc., and hurting your social life and your family life and your health by wasting time. It just doesn't make any sense. So I think that commercial real estate is a very bad investment. And I really think that in the next couple of years, we're going to see a lot of big commercial real estate companies go belly up. Yeah. And that's what the bond market is telling us to. All right. Next up, we got Ted Bell. Hey, Ted. Uh, Ted wrote, establishing trust is better than any sales technique. That's a great quote from uh, Mike Puglia. Thank you. You're, you're totally right. Transparency builds trust as well. Whenever you're pitching an idea and you work in sales, you always want to list the biggest risks as well when you pitch the idea. Yeah. All right. Uh, next up, T. T. T wrote, um, how do you get along with others in the United States firms as a foreigner when the majority of people are from uh, the United States? I think regardless of what country people are from, you can always bond with them by understanding what their passions are. And so before any meeting I have, right, or go to sit down with somebody in, in a one-on-one -on -one meeting I haven't met before, what I like to do is I like to go to their Twitter profile to see who they follow. And that way you can find out what they're passionate about. If they, if they follow hockey, you might be able to talk about hockey. If they follow cricket and you're passionate about that, you can talk about cricket, that sort of thing uh, as, as well. But regardless of what, what company people are in, when you join a new company, what I want you to do is in the first couple of weeks, just observe the culture. Observe how everything works. You know, Don't be too proactive, just kind of observe how things work. And find a couple of mentors in the company that have something in common with you. And I also want you to get mentored and get to know your boss's assistant. Because your, your boss's assistant has probably worked with your boss for many years at different companies. And he or she knows exactly how decisions get made. Okay. Um, but you got to find mentors as well. Yeah, in different departments as well. We, we all need Yodas. We all need Yodas uh, in order to, to progress. How can I mention Yoda without opening this, without opening this up? And this is going to be my thumbnail. What YouTubers do is... They, they, they stay still for a second or two during a webcast or a video so they can make a thumbnail out of it. So this is going to be a thumbnail for this week. Here we go. Okay. All right. And I love teaching with props. All right. Um, next up, Edward wrote, I'm 62 years old. Cool. Uh, and by the way, the average age of somebody starting a company in the United States is 51 now, which is my age. Yeah. Uh, Edward wrote, I'm 62 years old. I would like to continue to work, uh, but I'm having trouble overcoming that I'm overqualified for many positions in finance and technology. Uh, any thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. Oof. It's tough, man. Couple things. Number one, the average life expectancy 
globally is 26 years higher today than it was in the 1950s. So you're not 62. Alexa, what's 62 minus 26? 62 minus 26 is 36. So Edward, you're, you're 36. So if, if you're trying to network and you feel like you're overqualified, you might not get hired because of that. What I want you to do is during your networking meetings or your interviews, um, just say, you know, I, I, I'm, I love doing skill X, whatever it is you do. Um, I don't mind managing people as well, but if you just want me to do skill X, I'm happy to do so as I'm very passionate about this industry. Yeah. And that might kind of let them understand that, okay, okay. This person's not going to be expecting a massive salary or a very senior position. Yeah. And if that didn't make sense, uh, l let me know, please. Yeah. And what you can also do, um, you mentioned you're in the finance industry um, or, or the finance and tech industry. Um, before you go to these interviews, you can work really hard on creating one page write ups that outline or mention a product or service that you think the person you're meeting with can use to take their career or business to the next level. And I have 12 templates like that for every sector in my MBA program that I provide you with. And you can put that on the other side of your resume. So when you go to meet with them, you give them your resume on the other side is, is a one pager that will help them out. For example, if you're meeting with somebody that maybe is a portfolio manager in the finance industry, you can do a one page write up on Bloomberg GPT and what the implications are going to be. And then after that meeting, what you can do is you obviously send them a quick email thanking them or LinkedIn message. And every couple of weeks, you can send them a new article that you wrote or an interesting article that you read on AI or whatever topic it is that you've met with, that you, uh, that you spoke about during your one-on-one. Your -on -one. Okay. All right, next up, uh, uh, Gunjin wrote, uh, you're a great teacher, sir. Thank you. Um, and nice to meet you. You wrote, I I'm uh, Gunjin from India. I'm taking your cryptocurrency course right now, and I got to tell you uh, that I'm having it's having a great impact on my life. Thank you so much. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, uh, Bakul wrote, um, "Say, uh, say, I want to become the next uh, Chamath or Buffett or Harun. Um, the, the first two, at least. Yeah. Uh, I need to learn uh, capital structures and financial engineering." A 20, 29 years old, use your MBA to break into VC or PE or other question mark. Yeah, yeah. It, regardless of what industry you, you, you want to work in, and Andre, God bless you. Thank you for that, that $20 donation. That will go directly uh, to Project Magoo. And you can go to projectmagoo.org for more details. That's the schools we're building uh, in Africa. Thank you. You didn't have to do that, but I do love you. Thank you, uh, Andre from uh, Lakeland, Florida. Thank you. Okay. Uh, uh, now, Bacall, um, regardless of what industry you want, want to work in, it all comes down to networking. Your, you know, your net, your net worth is your, your net worth, your net, your net worth is your network. Your network is your net worth. Yeah. Um, relationships are always more important than product knowledge. Yeah. So it doesn't matter what industry you want to go into. You, you have to aggressively network. Yeah. And you can go to my, my website, download my networking book for more details on that. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. You didn't have to do that. Thank you. Okay. All right. Next up, uh, Cluster Puff uh, wrote, uh, hey, Chris, uh, thanks for hosting this live. My pleasure. Uh, would you have any tips or advice on how to prepare for a final round of interviews and business case to impress your interviewers and stand out against the competition? Oof. If it's a case study, um, what I recommend doing is uh, if you go to the Boston Consulting Group's website, uh, they have a bunch of sample case studies that you can use. Uh, and you want to practice case studies with your friends uh, before you actually pr give them during these interviews. And I also want you to have a bunch of crutches or frameworks in place that you can use, kind of like, like tools in your toolbox. Uh, for example, the SWOT analysis. And this, this is basically everybody in this call can, can use what I'm about to tell you. Um, so the SWOT analysis will help you analyze any company by looking at SWOT, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So what you can do is, regardless of what question you're asked, you can buy yourself some time, kind of like I am right now, by saying, well, let me consider the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. I'll kick it off with the strengths. The strengths are blah, blah, blah. Moving on to, that's a transition word, moving on to the weaknesses. The weaknesses are blah, blah. In terms of, another transition word, the opportunities. 
And lastly, the threats. The threats are yada, yada, yada. And the bottom line is this. And by doing what I just did there, you're buying yourself time to think of the answers as well. So your, your, your thought process sounds much more structured. You don't have to be right. You just have to sound logical. And you will if you use uh, frameworks. So use a SWOT analysis framework. You can use uh, the BCG matrix as well. You can search online on that or take my MBA program. I teach you about that. The product lifecycle, a framework, and many, many others. Yeah. And then transition words are crucial, like moving on to in terms of the bottom line is. Yeah. And if you're researching companies, make sure to read the annual report uh, as well as the S1 document if the company recently went, went public. And you want to mention this as well. Like during your, your interviews, you can say, well, I was, I was doing uh, equity research uh, on company X uh, by, by going to their investor relations website and reading their annual report or their, their S1. And I, I noticed that the risks are blah, 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 whatever. Yeah. And before I used to interview um, at, at companies when I worked at, at Goldman, before Goldman, I prepared a list of a couple hundred questions they could ask me. And I recorded myself answering the questions. Did I sound too monotone in my answers? Did I sound too arrogant? So I practice all these answers. And if you find that you ramble a lot, and I do sometimes, what you can do is you script all of your answers to questions. Then you go to ChatGPT and you do exactly this. You type this. Write me a 100 word summary for, and then paste your answer. And then ChatGPT will summarize it. And you can kind of use that to understand how to be more terse or get to the bottom line quicker. Okay, uh, uh, ne next up, DF wrote, what's the difference between your Udemy courses and your Haroon courses? Which courses would you recommend a, a student start with? Yeah, so my Haroon MBA degree program is only available uh, on my website, which is haroonmba.com. Um, yeah, uh, but the individual courses I have on my website are also on Udemy. Udemy is a great, great partner of mine. Uh, in terms of what course to start with, I would start with a, a course I recorded years ago, a seven and a half hour course called An Entire MBA in One Course. It kind of gives you a very high level overview uh, of, of business in seven and a half hours. And if you like that, you can sign up for my Haroon MBA degree program on my website, which is a couple hundred hours long. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cluster Buff wrote also, if given an offer, would you choose to stay at your current company where things are stable? colleagues are great, but pay is flat, or choose to take a leap towards a new emerging area or startup. Yeah. I, I, I'd be careful going to a, going to a startup. Um, the reality is that 99% of all startups don't make it. So if you're going to go to a startup, you know, make sure that your base salary is higher than your current base salary. And if they try to seduce you with stock options and they give you an offer, they say, you can either take salary X with this number of options, or you can take salary Y with this number of options. Choose the higher base salary always, 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 because in the unlikely event that that startup is going to be successful, they're going to give you options anyway. They're going to give you stock options, which cost them nothing to do. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. And then uh, uh, Myrna wrote, um, I was laid off in March. Sorry to hear that. Uh, and you wrote, thank you for your suggestions. You're, you're most welcome. Uh, you wrote, I'm working on, uh, on the tech field and it's been hard. Yeah, yeah. Let me know what's, what's hard about it. If, if there are certain tech concepts you're having issues with, there are great online courses you can take uh, from Angela Yu or Rob Percival. Start with Angela Yu, right? She teaches Python. She teaches every type of technology programming languages that, that's relevant today. She's great. Angela Yu, why you? Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, next up, Masa wrote, uh, are there any opportunities in making a living uh, with AI for someone like me uh, who is working uh, to be their own boss? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. AI is gonna impact every single sector, every sector. And once our AI course comes out, and this book will be part of it for free, of course, you can check it out because we do talk about all job roles in AI and every single sector uh, in all economies and how they'll be impacted or enhanced by AI. Yeah. But what I would do also, if you're curious, is take courses on machine learning online. And I have a machine learning course coming out soon as well. Um, machine learning can only help. And basically what that means is you look at statistical analysis like linear regression and much, much more. 
and machine learning is a subset of AI, and so is what's called deep learning. Yeah. Okay, uh, next up, uh, Ralph wrote, uh, uh, hi all, uh, hey Chris, hey. Uh, why is a hedge fund manager, why do they need a computer science degree? They, they don't, they don't, yeah. It might help you if you work at a hedge fund and you're a portfolio manager focus on the technology sector you know, like for me, I, I majored in management information systems in undergrad, uh, and I invested when I worked in the hedge fund industry in, in tech stocks. Yeah, but you don't need a computer science degree to, to get a job at hedge fund. Yeah, as a quant at a hedge fund, maybe you do. Meaning, if if you're doing R and D or, or risk management, that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, ne next up, um, I, I've got here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up Zoom. If anybody wants to ask me questions over Zoom, we, we can do it this way. I don't, I don't do it all the time, but what the heck. So in order to, to join Zoom to ask me questions, uh, just go to harunmba.com slash Zoom, all lowercase, Zoom, okay? And you click this link here, and you can ask me questions uh, over Zoom. And starting at, at 10 a.m. today, uh, uh, there's Zoom just for my, my silver students. So here it is here. And what I'll do is I will wait for you guys to join. Uh, and if you do join and you have questions, uh, uh, please make sure to, to raise your hand and, and thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, DF wrote, I, I know you think commercial real estate is a bad idea. Uh, what are your thoughts regarding the virtual office space that has uh, a, a commercial office addresses? Yeah. G give me a little bit more detail about that, please. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that there are, I have some students that are trying to get government grants uh, and they, they've tried to list virtual addresses and the government will not give them grants. But provide me with a little bit more color on that, please. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, but I really do believe that you can build a business off of Zoom if you want to uh, and, and work from your own house on your own terms as, as well. And, and that's what the pandemic has taught us, that life can go on, um, you know, commerce can continue um, uh, working just online, not going to offices. Yeah. And, and you don't have to be in Silicon Valley to start a tech company. That, that's, that's so 1990s. You can be anywhere in the world. Okay, next up, uh, DF wrote, I have a Bachelor of Science in Finance and Economics, an MBA in Strategy and Entrepreneurship, and a Doctorate Executive Leadership in Sustainability and Innovation. I take your courses to stay updated. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that. I appreciate that. And Luca also has a PhD. Yeah. He told me PhD stands for Plumbing, Heating, and Dishwashing. No, I'm just kidding. He didn't say that. He actually said PhD stands for Pizza Hut Delivery. Uh, Andre, thanks again. Okay, ne next up, uh, Werner wrote, uh, Hi, Chris, uh, Werner from South Africa. Uh, good to meet you. Uh, on writing a book from your experience, how would you recommend making or taking notes to capture your thoughts at any or all times? Yeah. So whenever I write books, I've, I've written a, a bunch of them. Uh, w what I usually do is I, it's very unstructured. What I usually do is I send myself hundreds of emails and the subject line of the email is the word book and whenever i come up with a good idea i'll send myself an email uh, to, to my gmail address in the subject line i'll put the word book and then i'll type my unstructured thoughts or ideas in the text uh, of the uh, the body of the email and then after sending myself at least 100 emails uh unstructured stuff what i'll do is i'll go to my gmail account and i'll do a search on the uh, advanced search on the subject line book and then I'll copy all the, the content of the 100, 200 emails, whatever it is, into Microsoft Word. Then what I'll do in Microsoft Word is I'll read through everything and I'll create buckets, sections, and then lectures. And I'll drag and drop stuff into those buckets and then I'll write and then I'll insert a table of contents. And that kind of gives me a rough outline of the book. But I think a better way to do it is, is this. And this is how I published my first book back in 2015. What I did was for two years, every week, that's 104 weeks, I wrote one article and I put it on LinkedIn. And after two years, I had enough content to make a book that has a spine thick enough. And what I did was the articles I put in this book 
were just repurposed from the articles I wrote in LinkedIn. And the articles I put first were the ones that got the most likes or comments or shares. Right, so that's kind of like a Darwinistic approach to, to literacy or, or to writing a book. Yeah. Okay, hey Brian, how are you, man? Great, great to see you. Uh, uh, Brian uh, lives uh, in, in the DC area. Uh, he works in financial services. He's a, he's a great guy. He owns, uh, you said you own a, own a Picasso? Yeah, you own a Picasso and a couple Salvador Dali paintings. And Spider-Man number one in 9.4% uh, 9 uh, condition. Yeah. All right, um, so let me go over here. And Radu has entered the meeting here. And Radu, if you have questions, please ra raise your hands. And Brian, if you wanna join Zoom, ple please do so. Again, you can go to uh, harunmba.com slash Zoom uh, to join that and to ask questions uh, is, as well, yeah. All right, so, so Brian wrote here, uh, since starting your classes a, a few months ago, my MBA program, you wrote, my business has grown, awesome. my motivation has improved, and most importantly, my personal life has improved, uh, the best money I've ever spent. Thank you, God bless you, man, and thank you for that. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, and I've learned so much from talking to you as well uh, during, during these calls and, and during the, the, the weekly silver office hours, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, and then Patrick wrote, I agree with Brian 120%. Thank you, Patrick, appreciate that. Okay, uh, uh, next up, uh, Ralph wrote, uh, hey Chris, what is the best business software to start? Yeah, so what I would do is there's a great venture capitalist who I've met with before and we were actually on the board of the same company. His name is Mark Andreessen. And he uh, is one of the co-founders of Andreessen Horowitz, a big venture capital firm. And he came out with this ground great, great breaking paper, you know, 10 or 15 years ago called Software is Eating the World. And what I recommend you do is I recommend you follow Mark Andreessen uh, on Twitter uh, and you go to Andreessen Horowitz website, which is a16z.com. And it's a16z.com because in between Andreessen and Horowitz are 16 letters. And what I want you to do is I want you to read everything that Mark writes here. And as I mentioned before, follow him on, on Twitter, etc. Right? They've got great stuff here. Here's Ben Horowitz. He went to Columbia. I, I met him um, at a Columbia event not too long ago. Um, but read everything he has to say here because he does talk about the future of software and which sectors have yet to be disrupted uh, by, by software. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I'll show you. He's here. Mark Andreessen. He's somewhere here. You'll find him. Okay. Let me go here. I'm going to admit everybody here into Zoom. Okay, uh, and, and if you have a question on Zoom, as you're being admitted, just raise your hand uh, and, and I'll come to you. Thanks. Okay, great. All right. Um, uh, next up, uh, DF wrote, uh, virtual offices offer support uh, uh, with uh, commercial address, open scan, mail for you, uh, virtual assistance for calendaring, appointment, meeting, uh, minutes, uh, advisory services, etc. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know. Like I, I, I've, I've never like every company I've worked at. I've been provided with an assistant, and I've always retrained the assistant to become an analyst. Uh, I, I don't really see a need uh, for that. Um, I love using software as well um, to you know, to help me with 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 monotonous tasks. Um, so I, I'm I'm not a big fan of doing that. But yeah, but all the power to you. You wrote the idea is to provide a virtual reality version of an entrepreneurial support while working from from home. Yeah. Yeah, not, not something I would use. Maybe maybe bigger companies do. Yeah. Uh, and then Ted wrote, why don't pirates take a shower before walking the plant the plank? Because they wash up on the shore. I, I love it. I love it. And, and speaking of, of walking the plant, uh, Oculus, uh, they have this this game or this product where you walk on a plank. And and you know it's virtual when you're doing it. It's absolutely terrifying though. It's I, I can't do it. I can't do it. Surprised people haven't asked about the, the Apple product. Okay, the Apple uh, VR product, which I will buy, I know. Um, okay, so you know it's expensive, I shouldn't. All right, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go over here to Zoomy, and if people, have, and, and, and Ted, thank you for that question, for that joke, more, more, more jokes, please, that's dad humor. I'm gonna be using that, yeah, with my kids. Okay, uh, Mirna, why don't you come off mute uh, and then uh, go ahead, please. How are you? I'm good. How about you? I'm, I'm always good. Thank you. 
Always good. So you're from Brazil. You live in, in Maryland now, yeah? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. Cool. So, yeah. So when I said that it has been hard, I probably not doing the networking as yeah. hard as I should. Mm -hmm. I do have a long background, like 25 years of export. Uh-huh. But um, I don't think I was up to date with the new technology. So I'm going to check out uh, Angela Yu yeah, and she, the other she, guy she, I need to yeah. rewatch and <laughs> yeah. because I miss his name. I'll, I'll show you right now. Yeah, so if, if you want to uh, retrain yourself, anybody can do this at any age. It doesn't matter anyone's background. Um, what you can do is, is as follows. I'll show you. Let me, let me share it here. Do a search here on... Okay. So do a search on Angela Yu. Okay, here she is here. Dr. Angela Yu. She's great. I, I've met her before. Uh, and she makes the best courses on the planet, man. Um, so you can learn um, you can learn Python. You can learn how to develop for iOS, etc. She's got great courses, a very in-depth. She's the best teacher on the interwebs. You can also learn from Rob Percival. I'm going to type his name here for you. I'll spell it. Here he goes. He's a good guy. I spent a day with him up at Cambridge. Um, I think he was teaching at Cambridge yeah, in England a while ago. Um, so let's go here. Rob Percival. Yeah, he, he's great as well. He's a machine, dude. Yeah. So you can, you can check out his course as well. Really, really good guy as well. And, and both Angela Yu and Rob Percival have English accents, which means they speak gooder than me. <laughs> After 20 years, I'm used to all kinds of English. Well, so I, thank I, you. I don't know. I went to a, a British boarding school, uh, and so I, I, I'm just convinced that, you know, if you have a British accent, you you speak gooder than me. You're smarter. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much. Of course. My, my pleasure. My pleasure. And we have Brian out front his house as well. Uh, it's a nice setup, dude. How are you? Good. How's everything? Good, man. Good. Thank you for those comments. God bless you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's nothing but the truth. Yeah. It's amazing how much motivation kicked back in. It kind of was in a slump for a few years. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. And dude, I I love your setup there. So you're you're out front. What what is your is that is that a webcam or what what is the camera you're using? It's I have multiple monitors. Yeah. outside on my front porch yeah nice. and it's uh the webcam is the one i'm using for the i i not air it would be okay. m2 chip the new iMac. dude that's so it's 1080 then looks good man that's yeah. awesome that's great that's incredible you, usually when, when you when you go outdoors you're 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 you know people are are overexposed uh, but i guess you're sitting in the shade there too that looks great man nice i chose if you look up i'm directly nice. into the street Nice. So because I'm directly under the tree, even though it's sunny and hot, I don't. Yeah. The sun can't get through. It's a very big tree. I love it. I love it. Excellent. And you're you're in the D.C. area, right? Yes, Alexandria, Virginia. Okay, I'll remember that. Alexandria. Okay, nice. Excellent. I, I, I talked about McLean, Virginia uh, earlier today. I'm sure you smiled. You you've been to McLean Family Restaurant before, right? I uh, know we spoke about it. Yeah. I did yeah. hear the person talk about the CIA and two yeah. of my neighbors work for the CIA. So yeah. I know lots of yeah. people. On the CIA. Yeah, that's where I first met with Gus Hunt, who was the CTO of the CIA at McLean, Virginia. Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah the, the McLean family restaurant. Excellent. Well, it's good. Good to see you, man. Good, good to see you. Excellent. Excellent. Yep. So I'm a little early from the silver one, but I like listening yeah. to your thing on YouTube. Awesome. So. No, no, thanks. But somebody had a question uh, to begin the webcast that I wanted you to answer because you're better than I am at this. Uh, so, so Jatan asked this question. Why are statements which are free from material omissions and errors called unqualified opinion? Why are statements? Yeah, I, I, I repeat that again. That's yeah, a little yeah. Because I remember. I think I got them. Because I remember it was last week. Silver, you talked about unqualified. Yeah, um, but I repeat the question. Yeah, sure. I just want to make I got yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So, why are statements which are free? from material omissions and errors called unqualified opinions, it is counterintuitive rather than it makes more sense to call it qualified opinion. Huh. Yeah. So I, 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 I saw that question. I didn't know the answer, but I was, I was saving it for later. But uh, don't worry if, if, if you don't, don't have thoughts on it. I just don't know the answer to that. Yeah. No, it's an interesting one. Um, I mean, almost everything is un qualified unless you're speaking one-on-one -on -one with a professional yeah. um, anything that goes yeah. online technically 
it was yeah. not monitored by the SEC or FINRA or approved in writing in advance, it's always going to be unqualified. Oh, that's what Unless it means. Unless you have that. That's uh, what it means. Because if I write anything, I first have to send it to the SEC. Well, yeah. FINRA, not SEC, sorry. Yeah. Uh-huh. FINRA. And once in 30 yeah. days they approve it, then I can actually publish it. And that's a qualified statement because okay. it's backed up. Everything's verified. Everything else, like what Jim Cramer and a lot of analysts do, would yeah. not qualify under yeah. those guidelines. Yeah, because they're doing it on their own. That is the answer I think they're looking yeah. for. But I could be. Uh, wrong, that makes so. sense. That's probably one of the reasons why, if you work in financial services, you have people have these long disclosures at the bottom of their emails. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So Jim Cramer worked on the same floor I worked at at, at Goldman before I did, and apparently. He was, him along with Robert Rubin were the two smartest people that ever worked at, at Goldman Sachs. Um, yeah, but, but he, um, he's got a great book uh, called Confessions of a Street Addict, uh, where he talks about how he got to where he is. He lived in the backseat of, of a car for years uh, when, he, when he went to Harvard Law before he made it to, to, to Wall Street. But anyway, the guy's pretty smart. Yeah. It is interesting. I met him a bunch of times on Stone Street in oh, my kidding. office. Wow. What, what, I, what's he like? Uh, what? Well, but he was always with his wife, and the problem with getting to know Jim Cramer, and this this was back when I was in my New York office, yeah. is so many people knew who he was, so you only got, like, even though I sat with him, it was hard to have a conversation to really get to know him, because yeah. everybody would have photo. Yeah. So I guess, so I, I can't say exactly what he's like, I just only know he was always nice enough, he saw me around, he let me sit yeah. with him and his wife, yeah. and we would just talk about what happened during the day, but most of the time it was just him taking photos with people. Yeah. No, he, he's definitely an icon, yeah. yeah. And I, I had a, yeah. a friend that worked for him at his hedge fund, and he, uh, I'm not going to go there. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, and, and Radu has his hand up uh, from Romania. Uh, Radu, please unmute yourself, and it's good to, good to see you. How are you today, man? Yeah, and the exposure to the camera outside is not very good, but okay. it is what it is. I wanted to ask uh, for the, this web pass. Did you saw the Raul Paul theories about the recession that the CEO of Vision? No, what, sorry, what, what, a, a poll? I, I didn't know. Tell me about it, please. Yeah, he was talking a, a lot about how um, because of the 2008 recession, we are still into that because the dollar was diluted. All right. And yeah. the, the public se- sector, it's 100% uh, in depth and the private sector even more in depth mm. and we keep issuing money yeah but yeah. we still didn't finalize the recession from 2008 and we're still issuing money to cover that up yeah yeah well I, I don't think things are as bad today as they were back in 2008 uh, whenever you have a crisis regulation follows um, I, I, you know, I, I, I always believe that you know the worst investment you can make is just sitting on cash. Cash is trash, you know, as as it continues to get diluted. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and that's the the interesting thing that I was thinking the last weeks. Yeah. We were talking about following the VIX uh-huh. to buy the VIX rise, you know, yeah. when people ask. But yeah. I, I was okay before the VIX is higher. Where yeah. do you keep the the funds to buy actually because if you're keeping the stocks yeah it doesn't help right but if you're keeping yeah. in the bank does help. so what what would be the strategy yeah there's no, the- there's there's market timing does not work um you know there's a famous quote which is the market can stay irrational longer than i can stay solvent um so i i i think long term when i invest i do a lot of equity research uh and i just keep accumulating until it becomes a full position. For me, a full position is 5% of my portfolio. Yeah. In terms of your question about the VIX, so for those who are not familiar with the VIX, it's a volatility index uh, that was created by the the CBOE, Chicago Board of Exchange, uh, back around 1990. And what it does, and let me show you guys a chart. Um, So what it does is it measures uh, the anticipated volatility in the options market uh, uh, for stocks in the S&P 500. And when the VIX is above 70 or 80, which rarely happens, the market usually crashes and there's a lot of fear out there and that's when you buy stocks no matter what, okay? It rarely happens, uh, I'll show you here. Okay, the VIX is incredibly low right now, uh, which means there's not much fear out there. So 
the VIX, the VIX actually spiked to uh, above 70 on two occasions. Okay, you can see one of them right there. Um, it, it, it spiked above 70. Um, actually, it got intraday above 80 uh, in March of, of two thousand or March and April of, of 2020, uh, when you know the price of oil was negative 20 bucks <laughs> in the futures market. And this is when you know a, lo a lot of unemotional investors that are brilliant like uh like elon musk backed up the truck and bought lots of shares it also happened uh back in 2008 in the fall of 2008 right here um uh, when we were within 24 hours of bank machines uh, not working right here um and that was uh close to a generational low in the s p um which occurred i think in early 2000 or 2009 so when the vix is above 70 or 80 which again is rare maybe once a decade or so um, and it's only happened on two occasions. No matter what happens, you buy stocks then. And it's going to feel like the, and, and actually here, it went intraday above 80. Yeah. But it's going to feel like the world is ending. And, and that's when no matter what, you buy stocks and some speculative stocks as well um, because nobody else is buying. So from a market psychology perspective, if you buy stocks that everybody loves and everybody already owns, there aren't that many incremental investors to buy and push it higher. Right? And so as Warren Buffett said, you gotta be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are, are greedy. But I would not use just the VIX to decide when to buy stocks, right? You can always do investment research or bottoms up analysis on individual stocks uh, and accumulate over time. And if you're not sure where to put your money, uh, I would just stick with ETFs, yeah. All right. So yeah. yeah, I think I told you a few weeks ago when I joined that I found a way to buy VU finally. Oh here. good, excellent. And for those who are not familiar with VU, ticker VOO, uh, is my go-to ETF to put money into when I'm not sure where to put my money. It's the S&P 500, um, and it's got a very, very low uh, expense fee. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, uh, it, and and a lot of people that live in different countries, like like Radu, uh, it, it's hard for them to buy uh, ETFs. Uh, how did you do it, Radu? Was it a, a certain bank you, you called? No, via eToro. eToro allows me to buy ETFs. Okay, good. Like the but the the main account that i'm using that's uh, interactive brokers mm -hmm. they buy directly i think with e it's like robin hood you don't directly own them maybe okay. that's why i okay. can buy them okay all right cool that's great man nice nice all right let's, let's go to uh myrna who has her, has her hand up please go ahead uh question i was in brazil when there was hyperinflation yeah. so was monthly account was yeah. absurd yeah it was like 100 <laughs> percent. I, I would say a month or, or something absurd mm -hmm. and how is the inflation calculated here yearly because i can imagine in brazil you could see a, a food from one month to another but in the united states it's yearly so i don't see yeah. So, so the government cannot the, wrap my mind yeah. how the calculation is done. Yeah. So, what the government does is they take a basket of products that they feel that most consumers buy from a sampling perspective, and they just monitor that. You know, it might be bread, eggs, um, gasoline, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, like in January with January, February with February. Yeah, they would look at the average price of certain products. Yeah, and I think you can okay. go to bls.gov, Bureau of Labor and Statistics. Uh, to check that out in more detail. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But when you have hyperinflation, it happened also in Argentina. Um, what happens is, you know, government has to materially raise uh, raise interest rates. Yeah. 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 What well, Brazil did, uh, do you know what Brazil did was just weird. They took uh, the money from everybody and just left a small amount. Yeah. So everybody was broke from one month to another. Wow. That was that was before Lula, right? Oh um, yes, yeah. it was. Yeah, yeah. It was with color. Okay, yeah, because you know Lula is 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 investor friendly. Like when when I used to go to invest in Brazil, it's because because of him. I, I know he went to jail. Now he's back again. But yeah, yeah. There is no good option. Yeah. yeah. In Brazil, for yes, for president, I I couldn't find a good option. Yeah, it's no. so. I have a lot of friends from Brazil, and they explain to me why. Brazilians in general never trust their politicians. And it goes back to Joao when he came over, I guess, from Portugal uh, to kind of settle the, the colony or Brazil, make it the, the new capital of the Spanish Empire or Portuguese Empire. Uh, he was corrupt. 
Uh, and so it's, it seems like it's a, I don't know, a rite of passage. All my Brazilian friends think that all politicians are corrupt. Yeah. Uh, there is a joke. I'm yeah. terrible in telling jokes. Yeah. But in Brazil, so if you go any to any country in the world, mm -hmm. you see hurricanes and uh, earthquakes and everything. Yeah. And so somebody asked God, God, why in Brazil there is nothing? There is no drought. There is no hurricane. There is no earthquakes. And then he said, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put good politic, polit people there, politics." And you're gonna see how bad that can be. Yeah. Because in Brazil it's a paradise. You yeah. go there, the weather is good, people good, people are great. Yeah. But yeah. The pol it, politics. It's it's politicians are terrible. It's fascinating. It's Lula was in jail. Now he's back. It's unbelievable. Yeah. 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 The, the, better than the previous president, who's a little bit. I'm a capitalist. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a capitalist, but I'm not that right wing. Yeah. 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 No. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. This is the uh, you know that this is the senti sentiment about politicians here also. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. after yeah. the hmm. communist, yes, after the communist, uh, all the, not, let not say all, most of the people that got rich was via corruption. Yeah, well, that's and right. Right when Ceausescu got assassinated Christmas Day back in 1989. I remember that. I think any economy that goes from communism to capitalism overnight, there's corruption. It has to be slow. Like like Russia was too fast. Uh, it has to be slow, at gradual moves every, every year. I think. I'm definitely a capitalist, but yeah, I'm I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the good thing, even we have some drawbacks drawbacks in the EU. Yeah. But one of the good things was also corruption fighting, because the EU has a lot of mandates. Hey, you didn't do that. We don't offer you funds. Yeah. And then they have to some some changes in laws and things like that. Yeah. 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 Hey, Frenchie, how are you? Hey, Frenchie, how are you? I, I, don't, okay. I, I don't see you. I can hear you. What's yeah, going I know. On? I got on my exercise uh, outfit okay, cool. my weight desk, so I didn't want to... Excellent. You fight. You fire up your PS5? What, what are you playing these days? God of, <laughs> God, God of, God of, God of War? What, 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 are you, what are you doing? I finished God I of War. I, I'm going to get to it. I have it in a while. I'm so yeah. busy. Yeah, but um, yeah, I am. I'm, I'm gonna get to you guys. Motivated me yeah. to get back into it. Like you, you, you and I have one thing in common. Many things in common. One of which is whenever our kids borrow our PlayStation or Xbox, after a while, oh, they call it theirs. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah. hey, when he comes, when he's here, I I don't even think about trying to get on it because yeah. he owns it. Totally, totally. My my kids are in, in playing a, a 2K basketball, and I and, yeah. I, and I, I have arguments with my kids. I say Michael Jordan is better than LeBron. And they're like, no way. I know, I yeah. know. It's a different era. But totally. see, they don't know. Yeah. They don't know the Michael Jordan era was was unbelievable because they, yes. they haven't never experienced that. Yes, he's. Oh, dude, have you seen on Amazon Prime? There's an amazing movie I saw the other night called Air. Uh, it's about uh, Michael Jordan being signed by Nike. And Justin, oh. yeah, Justin Bateman. Oh, yeah, 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 the yeah. movie, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And Phil, I haven't yeah, seen it yet. It's, yeah. Phil Knight is played brilliantly by Ben Affleck. Uh, Matt Damon's in it as well. It's it's great. Yeah, I think you'd love it. Really, that's cool. the one. And Chris Tucker plays in that. I heard too. Right? Oh, he that, that's right. Yes, yes. Yeah. He, he's the um, he's one of the, the senior managers at Nike as well. I saw Chris Tucker here actually in concert a couple of years oh. ago at the the Google uh, 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 Amphitheater. Uh, he opened for Dave Chappelle, and when Dave oh, Chappelle, wow. do when Dave Chappelle came out, I laughed so hard that it hurt. <laughs> like, I, I, like I couldn't breathe. Wow, like his, he's, his delivery, he's he's, he's amazing. I love him. He is. I, he is I, good. I, I follow him on on TikTok. Um, he's yeah. great. He's funny. He's amazing. Yeah. He's amazing. He's funny. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, real quick, I have a question sure. for you. Of real quick, I wanted to answer. I do. I was as I responded in the, in the chat, and I don't know if I do can hear me, but I I was I said VXX or UVXY. Um, those are two of the. Uh, for the VIX, if you want to monitor that, because I use that before, mm -hmm. you know, every time I monitor the stock market, I always check yeah. that. Yeah. And that's the 500. So as opposed to the VIX, yeah. the other option is the uh, VIX and the UVXY. Yeah. And, um, and French, Frenchie, what was, you gave me this unbelievable website uh, to do uh, re equity research on stocks. What was that website again? That was Findiz. Okay. Let me, I want to show people this because this is, this is an insanely great. Yeah, it's okay. great. It so is a good stuff. Fin Viz. 
Thank you for the info. Here it is. Yeah. Stock screener. Yeah. Finviz right here. Th this is unbelievable. Uh, you got a, a, a map of the market at the bottom right hand corner here. Um, you know, the, the bigger the square, the bigger, bigger the market cap. The more green it is, the more it's up today. Um, so NVIDIA is down slightly today, big company. Uh, uh, Microsoft is up. Well, that's a big move for Microsoft. Yeah. It is. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, this is a great, great website for stock screener. It's Finviz, that's Fin. Yeah, and if you click on the um, the part, the one at the tab right above your cursor that says Maps, uh -huh. you click on that. Yeah, and I was oh, going to show them so the cool. uh, the one that goes to the bubble. If you go right down, the uh, all the way to the left, you see where it's up up. See where it says Map. Go up a little bit more. Oh, and go right to, Yeah, see bubbles. Okay, cool. Yeah. 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 You have a free version, and you have a, a paid version. This free is version. unbelievable, okay. man. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's I I look at that every morning. I love uh, it. It's the only difference with that one because it's free. You get a fifteen minute delay. Yeah. So oh, these the, the, these are the sectors here. The sectors, yeah. Very, it, it's, okay. it's, it's an awesome. So, it's awesome site. I it has a screener, a screener on it that's just unbelievable. Amazing. Yeah, you can screen it by. I do my bubbles by a volume, as opposed Indeed. to market capitalization. Go up a little bit. Oh, um, yeah, right there. Yeah, volume. I do. A, you can choose whatever you want, but yeah. I use them, but it, you change something down at the bottom. So oh, yeah, yeah. I can change it too, yeah. I did NASDAQ here, yeah. Right, uh-huh. How fascinating. Oh, I love this. Thank you for showing yeah. this. Everybody out there, check out uh, FinViz. That's F-I-N-V-I-Z. That's how we say in Canada, Z. <laughs> uh, dot, dot, <laughs> dot com. Very cool. Thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. I love um, it. Yeah, absolutely. And let me see. Oh, oh, quick question. Um, in regards to, I know Python is number one. Uh -huh. But I, I read an article the other day uh, mm -hmm. on the, uh, I think it's called the, um, I think it's something that monitors all the, the most popular software. Uh -huh. there, there were two, one, um, Python was one. I'd like to get your thoughts on the other three. Mm -hmm. They had four. Um, one was Clojure, the other one was Haskell, mm -hmm. and the other one was Rust. Haskell seems to be the one that the, mm -hmm. a lot of the hedge funds are hiring now. Yeah, and, and I would say that for educational purposes, a lot of people say Pascal in school. I, I, I did it years ago as, as well. Uh, I Not Pascal, Haskell, Haskell, Haskell. Oh, Haskell. Okay, Haskell. Yeah. That makes more sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not, uh, I remember yeah. Pascal. Pascal yeah, okay. was way back. Okay, sorry. I had a senior moment there. I misheard you. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> I was with you. I was yeah. with you, too. I thought that's what they said, too. But yeah, yeah. You. Yeah, I'm not too familiar with those other ones, uh, but I know yeah, they, it's, but if you yeah. st start with Python, you can't go wrong. Yeah. No, no, yeah. you can't. Okay. And, and, and Luca, <clears throat> who's one of the professors now at, at, at my, my, my business school, my MBA program, he's we're going to be partnering to teach you guys a lot of different programming languages, uh, including uh, Python, but not Pascal. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> I think I have a book on the shelf. Yeah. Cool. yeah. Anyway, I still have yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember it. I remember we had to take a little triangle, have it move around the screen. I remember that oh, year, years ago. Hey, that's that's way that's going back a little bit. Yeah, dude, <laughs> dude, I I started programming COBOL. That's that's yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. That's how I learned it. That's how I started. Totally yeah. computer oriented business language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same I, thing I, with, I, with Myrna. And, oh yeah, yeah. Myrna, Myrna, yeah, yeah, yeah. COBOL. Yeah, and if there's oh uh, yeah, Fortune, yeah. COBOL, Pascal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. VB, yeah. VB. That's what VB was. Yes, big. I love VB. Oh, yeah. It's, 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 yeah, yeah. it's part of object. It's part of uh, 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 Excel. I love it. Yeah. yeah, and it's still hanging in there. It's yeah. still around. Yeah, so. it's, it's it's fun too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I it just is, want to ask that. I want to clarify yeah. what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. what what I'll do, uh, I'll probably bring Luca on again to another call. Um, if, if he's not too busy, he's the busiest guy I know, uh, and he can answer more more techie questions. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, and one note was that if you're starting with Python, it might be the future also uh, due to the Mojo project. So, you know, Chris Lechner, the designer of L L L LLVM, and he did the compiler for C line, the C and C compiler on top of LLVM, he now designed Mojo. And it's usually using the same sy syntax as Python, but mm -hmm. enable parts of the code like defining the function different and run at the C level of uh, speed. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you found um, Python easier? Yeah, yeah. you said Python was, was he's doing it with Python? Yes, yeah. it's on top of Python. Okay. 
And it, just imagine instead of defining the function with def, you define the function with something else. I don't remember exactly the syntax now, mm -hmm. but that, that, that particular function will be run at the C level uh, speed. It mm, will, cool. the type checks and everything like that, the memory checks, and it will run really fast. So it will be the scripting language, Python on top, that will, let's face it, 80% or 90% of the time you're only in the scripting language. But when you need the performance, you just use almost the same syntax in Python and access the C performance. And then you don't need the two languages because a lot of time you have the one scripting language in most of the software and one speed language. And then the communication between them is the most horrible part. Yeah, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be adding Python to the curriculum soon, I promise. A couple comments here from a uh, financial advisor show who wrote, I did what you said exactly from becoming a thought leader on LinkedIn to showing up on social media and creating my pages. And guess what? I've landed a, a new job uh, in Qatar uh, months ago. Congratulations. It's awesome. Yeah. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, so everybody has got to publish stuff on LinkedIn and all social media platforms. It's free to do. And it's a way to build social currency and the brand of you. And as I mentioned earlier, you can take all the articles you publish on LinkedIn and after a while, put them together in, in a book. Repurpose your content like Gary Vaynerchuk talks about. Yeah. Next up, a uh, financial advisor show. And this, in addition to my freelance job, which I really enjoy and have a passion for. Awesome. Uh, and then uh, next up, the term unqualified in auditing refers to an audit report that's been prepared by an independent external auditor, stating that a company's financial statements are fair and accurate. Okay, interesting. Yeah, and I mentioned earlier how it's important to make sure that before you invest in publicly traded companies, that they have a well-known auditor from a big four firm like KPMG, PW, Pricewaterhouse, Deloitte, et cetera, and Ernst & Young, those are all four, yeah. Um, and then you wrote here, it's also known as a clean opinion. In this context, unqualified means without any reservations or, or exceptions, yeah. And now I know why Chitan said it seems unintuitive because that sounds like the word qualified instead of unqualified. And Jatan had the first question today about that at 7.05 a.m. And thank you for that, Brian, as well, for, for clearing, clearing, uh, clearing that up. Thank you. Uh, next up, despite its potential negative connotation, it actually means there are no qualifications or exceptions to the auditor's opinion about the fairness of the financial statements. Thank you. Thank you. And Bakul, thank you so much for that $5 donation. You didn't have to do that. Uh, thank you. God bless you again. That will go to Project uh, Magoo. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with, with Project Magoo, uh, it's a charity, uh, which is in Vital's name, not mine, uh, but I'll show you here. So Project Magoo, so I, I met with um, I, I met with uh, Vital, uh, one of my, my, my platinum students in my MBA program, years ago down here uh, when I was in Berlin. And um, he, he came to the conference to, to meet with me at a Udemy conference, uh, and we did an interview. And during the interview, uh, and I love to do what Sir Richard Branson does, which is screw it, let's do it. During the interview, we both mentioned, hey, let's build a school in, in Rwanda, uh, in Magu, his hometown where he grew up. Uh, and so we did it. Uh, and I brought my son to Rwanda a couple summers ago, and we're going again this summer uh, to, to build a school. And the kids loved my son, Andrew, because um, Andrew was using Snapchat and showing them the, the filters and they were laughing so hard. It was, it was awesome. Yeah. And here's the whole team here. It's great. So again, I am going back to, uh, uh, to, to Rwanda. Uh, th this summer, and I'm going to try to do this weekly webcast uh, from Rwanda uh, uh, during maybe the third or fourth week uh, of July, if I can get internet access at the school that, that we built. Yeah, yeah. So thank you so much for that donation, but cool. That will go directly to uh, Vital's charity. Thank you. Okay, um, and it cost me about a hundred grand per school. Um, so we're we're trying to build a bunch more, and as I mentioned before, a lot of the profits uh, from what I do. Um, online teaching goes to building schools uh, in Africa. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, McCool wrote here, um, corporate bonds, ETFs like ticker LQD or ticker HYG yielding above 10% right now, uh, get capital gains when rates drop, bond prices up, uh, less default risk in ETF, HYGW sells calls for extra income. What am I missing? Yeah. Please be really careful whenever you see high dividend yields uh, on anything option related that's an ETF um, because those yields are usually not sustainable and it might reflect 
uh, you know, one off, uh, 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 you know, two standard deviation event type uh, uh, dividends. What you want to do is you want to look at the average dividend over the past 10 or 10 or 15 years, if you have the data for it, to see what the real dividend is. You also want to go uh, and read the entire prospectus as well. Um, and when you're investing in companies that buy and sell quickly or ETFs, uh, like with, with option based ETFs, um, as you know, as you, you implied there, you're going to be paying much higher taxes as well. Yeah. yeah. That's why index funds are better investments usually than mutual funds, because in, in most countries, if, if you profit on something in less than a year, you pay higher capital gains taxes. But, but, and that's what mutual funds do. They, they, they buy and sell a lot. Uh, all year long, so you have higher uh, higher taxes if, if they're up in a given year. But index funds, unlike mutual funds, what they do is they're long-term focused. They don't buy and sell. It's just an index. So you're going to pay less taxes if, 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 if the uh, that index is up in a given year. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Bakul wrote here, um, uh, do you like corporate bonds or REITs yourself, Chris, or mostly stay in stocks and maybe T-bills given rates right now? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I like to... So I, I prefer equities. I do. I, I do own some corporate bond funds as well uh, that, are, that are lower risk. Um, but I'm always an equities person because I love investing in companies that I humbly believe are five by fives, meaning a 500% return within five years. Am I wrong a lot? Oh my God, most of the time. But directionally, I'm, I'm right quite often with stocks. I do a ton of research on. And in my MBA program, I provide you with all the tools that I use to pick stocks uh, is, as well. Yeah. The thing about bonds is you'll never make more than you know 10 or 15 percent. Uh, and if you make that much, it's usually you know high yield or junk bond territory, which, which is risky. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in terms of REITs, um, so REITs, I have some in my portfolio, and by law, REITs uh, pay out 90% of the operating profit in the form of dividends. Uh, but I'm a little bit cautious these days on, 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 on anything commercial, real estate related. Um, and when it comes to my real estate investments, I got my, my house. That's how we say it in Canada, right, Caroline? House. It's not house. It's house. I have my house, uh, and I own a bunch of property in southern Ontario, where, where Carolyn lives, um, as, as well as in Texas. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. And Johnny Grow lately wrote 31st. I think you're talking about uh, the webcast date uh, for um, Alexa. What day of the week is July 31st, 2023? July 31st, 2023 is on a Monday. Oh, it's a Monday. Yeah. So whatever the Thursday, the last Thursday is in July, we'll, we'll be doing it from, um, uh, from Rwanda. Yeah. Carolyn, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Chris. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I, need to, I really need to invest in camera because now I'm blurred and uh, anyway, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> yeah. Well, Brian, Brian has a, an M2 chip uh, MacBook Air, uh, which has a 1080p camera. Look at that resolution. He took it outdoors. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I don't recommend anybody buy a Logitech camera, um, but it looks like the new Mac, the MacBook and the MacBook Air have incredible resolution cameras. A MacBook something? Yeah. 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 Come on. Yeah. I look into it. It has to be less than sixteen dollars, okay? Okay, then the Mac <laughs> it wouldn't work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I have a question, Chris. Sure. So um, I I got a position in a REIT um, with Medical Property Trust and ticker MPW mm -hmm. a few months ago, and then um, their auditor did not disclose that they were having issues with with one of their tenants, which happened to be their biggest tenant. Yeah. And so now there are some investors are suing them, suing, uh, you know, the company, the REITs for, you know, for that uh, not disclosing, you know, yeah. uh, that fact. And then, um, so they, there's a civil uh, lawsuit, uh, which I joined because it doesn't cost anything, right? So yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. So do you have any of that experience? I, I, you know. Yeah. 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 When I do equity research on REITs or any portfolio for that matter, I usually don't like to see any position that's greater than 10% of the fund. Right? It's uh, and, and quite often, whenever companies report earnings, sorry about that, when companies report earnings on their quarterly earnings calls, during the Q&A session, analysts will ask, did you have any 10% customers? And so oh, customer yeah. customer mm -hmm. concentration is, is, is a big deal from a risk management perspective. Um, so if you go and read the prospectus for that, whatever the ticker was on that company, MGY or MYG, whatever it was, uh, you might find that they disclosed that one customer was way more than 10%. And if they did not disclose that, then I understand why there's a, a class action lawsuit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's true. Yeah. Like it's what well, it's a, it's a bigger customer anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a, it's a big REIT and uh, it's a hospital REIT, right? So oh. I guess they just have to sell a yeah. couple of hospitals and they should be okay. So hmm. it's it'd be interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, I, I hope you get something out of it. I, I do. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. But the the yeah. the um the stock is is back. Like, not up to what I pay for, but it's, it's going up, you know, it's uh, not very far, I'm just $2 away, so yeah. I'm not worried, yeah. but, yeah. you know, yeah. Yeah. see it's yeah. what happened. I hope I get some money out of this. Yeah. Yeah, what I recommend is, uh, like in, in the MBA degree program, which, which you're, you're in, uh, if you go to EMS 4-2, that's Economics Management and Strategy, Semester 4, Class 2, there's a 100-step template that I provide you with to do research on companies. And I recommend filling that out before buying stocks. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of yeah, like yeah. A, sa a safety net to, to help out. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I should do that. I should not yeah. use my crystal ball. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, it's all good. It's all good. Hey, Brian, please. Hey, Caroline. Um, I think you can hear me. Yeah. Um, as far as getting money back for the lawsuit, you're probably ninety nine point nine nine percent not going to get anything. The only people who get anything who have actually lost in losses, the bond holders. and then even then the lawyers get 90% of it, yeah. so you get very little back, yeah. and yet generally you have to pay $100,000 or more in losses. So unless you're in that camp, I wouldn't sweat over it too much. Okay. And it doesn't sound like you sold it, in, to what I heard, yeah. it doesn't sound like you ever sold it, no. so technically you don't have a case because you never lost anything. Mm -hmm. It's not yeah, sold. it's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, actually, I yes. bought some more, so I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm pretty good. Uh, I'm just two dollar away from breaking even, and in the meantime, I, I got some dividends, so it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, but I wouldn't expect anything from the lawsuit because you don't technically okay. qualify for that. I see. Okay. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Cool. Cool. Okay. That's all. Didn't mean to interrupt. No, that, that was great. Thank you. Please uh, st stick around, please. So Johnny wrote, uh, no, I was saying the 31st in chat. Oh, you're 31st in chat. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Good, good to see you. So what I'm going to do, uh, uh, Brian and Carolyn and Frenchie, stay, stay here, please, because uh, you guys are uh, in the MBA program. Uh, and uh, you can chat amongst yourselves. I'm going to turn myself off while I wrap up the call. And I'll see you guys uh, in, in a couple of minutes um, as we do the Zoom call for, for Silver. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap up this call uh, right right now. Um, so I, I hope you enjoyed our 233rd weekly webcast. Damn, that's a lot. Boy, Caroline, can you hear me? We'll, we'll, be in our, we'll be in our sixth year really soon of, of doing this. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed it. Click the like button and subscribe um, if, if this was helpful and only if this was helpful. Uh, also go to my website, harunmba.com to check out my, my courses, my MBA programs, et cetera. God bless you all. Have a, have a great week. Uh, and I'm going to end this webcast as I always do with a very short, life-changing uh, uh, interview uh, that I licensed uh, with Steve Jobs. Uh, and I licensed it from the Silicon Valley Historical Association. And they asked me to mention that every time uh, I show this video. God bless y'all. I'll see you next week and every single week. Take care. When you grow up, you tend to get told that the world is the way it is and you're your life is just to live your life inside the world, try not to bash into the walls too much, uh, uh, try to have a nice family life, uh, have fun, save a little money. Um, but life, th that's a very limited life. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing, is to shake off this, uh, th this uh, erroneous notion that life is, is there and you're just going to live in it, versus embrace it, change it, improve it, make your mark upon it. Um, I, I think that's very important. And however you learn that, once you learn it, uh, you'll want to change life and make it better because it's kind of messed up in a lot of ways. Um, once you learn that, you'll never be the same again.